Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Welcome back to another episode of Jum'an Nights It's going to be the final episode of season 1 But nonetheless a very 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 important episode Where we're going to be closing our series on Tawheed Where we're going to discuss the relationship of Allah with his servant So without further ado let's get straight into it the relationship of Allah with his servants we want to discuss this matter in the following points number one what is Tawheed number two how did the Imam speak about the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala number three how does the Quran speak about the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and number four we're gonna have a short look at some of our supplications and visitational supplication literature so when we look at what is Tawheed I know what you guys must be thinking what do you mean, what is Tawheed? We learned this in Madrasa, like, year one. Like, this is the first thing that we learn is to profess that there is one Allah. And that's correct. But the real question is, how do you understand this belief, right? Because for some people in their mind, right, when they think about Tawheed, they've got these things, set things in their mind. They've got, okay, cool, these are the Usul al-Din. There's five Usul al-Din. There's Tawheed. There's Nubuwa. There's Imama. And so on, right? So... When people think about Tawheed, what they think is that this part of the Usul al-Din, Tawheed, represents Allah himself, right? And that is a big misconception, right? Tawheed, in fact, is actually a conception that we have in our minds that we are taught to believe by the infallible, the Hujjah of Allah upon earth. And there's a reason why that distinction is so important. Right, because last week, if you remember when we spoke about the comparison between our Tawheed and uh, the other schools of Islam, we saw this statement by Amir al-Mu'mineen, right, at the end of the episode, when we spoke about what he said, where he said that praise be to Allah whose worth cannot be described by speakers, right, whose magnificence cannot be understood by even the highest intellectual uh, individuals, right. So what do we see here? Imam Ali is saying that Allah is beyond the human mind, regardless of what you say, regardless of what you think, regardless of anything that you attribute to him, whether that be names, whether that be, you know, attributes, all of those things are actually things that Allah is still going to be beyond, right? So what is Tawheed then? What are these attributes that we get taught? These are conceptions in order for that which is not able to be comprehended, right? Which is Allah which no one can comprehend, is being made to be put in a way where we've been ordered to understand Allah in this way in, in accordance with our minds. And we've been ordered and taught to abide by these, right? In order for us to be able to connect to Allah in the capacity of our own minds. So what we understand is that in the teachings of Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam, Tawheed is actually a conception in our minds. And once our mind begins to accept this, more and more we see that this belief of Tawheed becomes closer to our hearts, right? And then after that, it becomes part of the very individual. What do I mean by that? The word Tawheed in Arabic, right, L linguistically is Sigha Taf'il, yeah? Which means that this is actually an action, yeah? Tawheed is to actually act and, and, and move towards something, right? The, the, the fact that the word is actually a verb and describing an action means that there has to be something going on here. It's not just a belief that you hold, right? So what do we understand here? We see that Tawheed, it begins in the mind, in the intellect, right? Of course, with proofs and intellectual and rational arguments. And then slowly but surely, when that Tawheed becomes cemented in our minds, we see that now the heart begins to accept this Tawheed until the mind and the heart, right? The Tawheed of the intellect and the Tawheed of the heart become one, right? And this is the action of Tawheed, the oneness between the mind and the heart in their understanding of Tawheed. This is the understanding of Tawheed according to the teachings of Ahl Bayt alayhim salam. Of course, when the individual reaches the stage where his mind, the Tawheed of the intellect and the heart become one, that is when he truly becomes a Muwahid. Why? Because that Tawheed becomes part of his existence. It begins to show on his tongue, in the things that he says, in the things that he does, right? Every thought that he takes at one point when he reaches perfection will be in line with that understanding of Tawheed. 
So how do the Imam speak about the worship of Allah? If we think about Tawheed as a conception that we take and we understand from the Ma'soom, the infallible Imam, then that makes the infallible Imam integral in that belief of Tawheed. Because the infallible is the one who teaches the belief of Tawheed himself, right? It becomes his understanding that we are able to understand Allah through. And this is something that we spoke about in our first episode in this series about Tawheed, right? We spoke about the ayah of the Quran where we mentioned that those who believed, they said that we believe in your God to the Prophet, right? We believe in your God and the God of your fathers, right? And he mentioned the names of the prophets that came before is because of their conceptualization and their teaching and their explanation that those people were able to believe in God in the most beautiful and the most efficient way, right? So it becomes that person's understanding that that person takes to become a muwahid. And in our case, it is none other than the Imam of our time, Imam Sahib al-Zaman alayhi salam, right? So he is integral to our understanding of Tawheed, right? Let's have a look at some literature in order to familiarize ourselves with the concept of the Tawheed of the intellect and the Tawheed of the heart. When we take a look at volume 1 of Al-Kafi, page 64, in the edition that I have, Dar al-Murtada, we have a narration from Imam Al-Kadhim, right? What does he say? And this is a narration about the lowest understanding of Tawheed, the lowest level of Ma'rifa, right? So this companion, he asks Imam Al-Kadhim, what is the minimum requirement? What is like, if I know absolutely nothing about Allah, what is the minimum that I should believe about Allah, right? So then the narration says, it's an Al-Fatih ibn Yazid, and he narrates from Imam Al-Kadhim, he says, Qala, sa'altuhu an adna al-ma'rifati faqal, right? He asked him about the lowest minimum requirement that you need to have of knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Faqala, al-iqraru bi'annahu la ilaha ghayruh, right? The testimony that there is no Lord except him, wa la shibha lahu wa la nadhir, and there is nothing that is similar to him. Wa annahu qadimun muthbatun mawjudun ghayru faqeed, wa annahu laysa kamithlihi shay, right? And the idea that he is eternal, positively existing, and not able to go into absence, and that there is nothing like unto him, right? So this is the most basic, most minimum requirement of Tawheed, right? And it's strange because we see, like we explained last week, there are even Muslims that don't meet this minimum requirement of being able to understand that there is nothing like unto him, right? So the Imam says this is the minimum requirement, right? And this is the Tawheed of the intellect. If you look at this narration, everything that's mentioned in this are things that can be proven rationally. They don't require someone to teach you them, right? And this is why this is just the beginning of the understanding of Tawheed, right? A lot of the time people, they get really mixed up with Tawheed, right? And they end it at this, the idea that Allah is alone, that he is existing, that he has these attributes and you know that there's nothing like unto him and they end their understanding of Tawheed here and that is at the Tawheed of the intellect, that is the lowest level of Tawheed. So moving on, yeah that's an example of a narration with regards to Tawheed of the intellect, right? The lowest level of Tawheed. Then we have a narration here from Imam, Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam, right? We have a narration from Ibrahim ibn Umar on the same page. He says, Sami'tu Aba Abdullah Yaqul. He says, I, I heard Imam Sadiq say, The Imam says, Inna amra Allahi kullahu ajibun illa annahu qad ihtajja alaykum bima qad arrafakum min nafsih. Right? So he says, The matter of Allah, all of it is strange. It's, it's so hard for it to be understood, right? It is ajib, right? Illa annahu qad ihtajja alaykum bima qad arrafakum min nafsih. Right? Except that Allah, he's given you a proof. He's actually established a proof upon you by that which he has given you to understand from himself, right? And how does Allah establish the proof on us? We spoke about this in our first episode, right? The hujjah of Allah on earth, right? Ihtajja alaykum hujjah, right? This is the establishing of the proof upon people about the existence of Allah and the understanding of Allah, right? If we take a look at what we say in Mafatih al-Jinan, we say in Ziyarat Ali Yaseen, with regards to all of the Imams, that they are the Hujjah of Allah upon earth. And then we say to our Imam, our living Imam, Imam Sahib Al-Zaman, وَأَشْهَدُ أَنَّكَ حُجَّةُ اللَّهِ أَنْتُمُ الْأَوَّلُ وَالْآخِرُ Right? We say that we bear witness that you are 
the hujjah of Allah upon earth. You are the proof of Allah upon earth. You are the first and you are the last. Right now, if someone was to take this statement out of context, right, they would, you know, they would take it as, uh, you guys, Shia, you guys are doing shirk, you guys have put the imams first and the last. Of course, Allah is the first and the last, right? And we believe that the imams are but creations of Allah, but Allah made them his hujjah upon earth, He made them the way to Him to understand Him, to understand His tawheed, right? He made them the gate to his tawheed, right? And this is what the imam here is saying, right? That Allah, he's given you, established a proof upon you, right? Other than that, what would you know of Allah? Yeah, inna amr Allahi kullahu ajib. The understanding of Allah is all, all like strange. It's something that you wouldn't be able to understand, except that there's a hujjah here, right? To help you understand. If that hujjah was not there, you 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 have nothing nowhere to go you end up like the other schools of islam right who end up understanding allah in the strangest and strangest of ways right they ascribe hands to him and feet to him and all sorts because of this because they don't have a hujja right they don't have the imam of their time to explain to them right even if some of them are right in some things you always find that there will be some things that they have completely missed the the point on completely Right? That's inclusive of all of the other schools of Aqidah in Islam. Whether that be the Asha'ira, the Maturidiyah, whether that be the, the, uh, the Atharis, whether that be the Jahmiya, whether that be any of the, the Zahiriya, any of the Qadiriya, all of the sects that came and they tried to explain the, the Tawheed of Allah, including the Mu'tazila as well, right? All of them had severe deficiencies in the understanding of Tawheed because they lacked an Imam. Right? And that is why the Tawheed of the Ahlul Bayt السلام, can never be matched. And that is why their Tawheed is the only Tawheed. Their Tawheed is the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What this explanation is giving when we say Antumul Awal wal Akhir, it means that they are the focal point in understanding this Tawheed, right? The Prophet, when he came and he wanted to teach the people Tawheed yeah, in Bedouin Arabia, Right? What was he trying to do? He was trying to take them away from the worshipping of idols, right? That was the main aim there, right? So the level of Tawheed that Rasulullah had to come with was at a very low level. Yeah, you're speaking to people who are literally worshipping idols, worshipping stones, right? After all of the prophets have come, Prophet Ibrahim came, all of the prophets that came and they taught you about Tawheed, Despite all of that, you're somehow still worshipping stone Like I don't know for you Rasulullah has to come and he has to give you the lowest level of intellectual rational arguments In order to take you away from the worshipping of idols And to bring you towards the worship of Allah That's a very low level of Tawheed But of course as we know And we spoke about quite briefly in one of our episodes with regards to the era of Tawil We know that each of the beliefs in Islam They get better and they become stronger right the reason for that and more complex right the reason for that is because the human beings are constantly on a journey right we're on a journey towards perfection Allah wants us to be on this journey right so slowly but surely Allah reveals more and more of his religion we see that through the prophethood of all the prophets that came before they were all leading up to the prophethood of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam then we have the al bayt alayhi wa sallam everything leading up to the Khaim of Al Muhammad, right? Everything has a lead up, right? And Tawheed is no different. Tawheed as an understanding evolved and it became greater, right? After the appointment of Imam Ali alayhi salam at Ghadir Khum, right? Because that was where the era of Ta'wil began, right? And this is where the understanding of Tawheed gets greater and to remain upon the simplistic Tawheed that was before, that would be tantamount to disbelief because you have not moved with that which Allah has ordered you to move with, right? And taking the focal point of the hujjah of Allah in order to understand your tawheed, right? What do I mean by this? I'm going to actually go into a few texts so that we can understand this concept a lot more clearer, right? Because right now it might seem that, you know, I've, I've said a lot, but I haven't read much from the text. But don't worry, we're going to get to it, right? And it's all going to be, inshallah, clear enough towards the end, inshallah. But this understanding is crucial. The idea that the focal point of Tawheed and the understanding of Tawheed goes back to the Imam of our time, right? This is why the Ahl Bayt salam, we have so many narrations. What do they say? They say, لَوْلَانَا مَا عُبِدَ اللَّهِ وَلَوْلَانَا مَا عُرِفَ اللَّهِ Right? If it wasn't for us, then Allah would not be worshipped, right? And if it wasn't for us, then Allah would not be known, 
right? What does that mean? When we say Allah would not be worshipped, is that a, a fair statement to make, right? Of course, there was other religions too. There was Christians, there was Jews. They were worshipping Allah too. Why does the Imam say that? If it wasn't for us, then Allah would not be worshipped, right? That's why we're going to look through a few texts today to try and explain this concept a bit more further so that you can understand where this these um, concepts are coming from. And this is where we want to talk about a final narration from the Imams alayhi salam, also in Al-Kafi in Kitab al-Hujjah, page 129 of the edition that I have, uh, Darul al-Murtada. We have a narration here from Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam. Jabir al-Ju'fi narrates from Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam. He says, سَمِئْتُ أَبَا جَعْفِرٍ يَقُولُ إِنَّمَا يَعْرِفُ اللَّهَ أَزَّ وَجَلَّ وَيَعْبُدُهُ مَنْ عَرَفَ اللَّهَ وَعَرَفَ إِمَامَهُ مِنَّا أَهْلَ الْبَيْتِ Right? He says, the only ones yeah, that know Allah and worship Him are the ones who know Allah and know the Imam, His Imam, from us Ahl al-Bayt alayhi salam. وَمَنْ لَا يَعْرِفُ اللَّهَ أَزَّ وَجَلَّ وَلَا يَعْرِفَ الْإِمَامَ مِنَّا أَهْلَ الْبَيْتِ فَإِنَّمَا يَعْرِفُ وَيَعْبُدُ غَيْرَ اللَّهِ هَكَذَا وَاللَّهِ ضَلَالًا Right? He says, the one who does not know Allah, right, and does not know the Imam from us Ahl al-Bayt, then he knows and he worships an Allah other than Allah, right? Just like that in misguidance, right? He's worshipping a fragment of his imagination, right? That is not Allah that he worships because if he does not know the Imam, he has not even found the gate to Allah. How is he going to worship an Allah when he hasn't even reached the gate of that Allah that Allah has ordered you to go through to get to him, right? That's what the Imam is saying here. You don't know the Imam, yeah, you're not going to know Allah. You're going to be worshipping an Allah that is completely a fragment of your imagination and of no value, right? This is the Tawheed of the Imams, alayhi salam. This is what they're telling you. There's no Tawheed without Ahlul Bayt, alayhi salam. You want Tawheed without Ali bin Abi Talib? Impossible. It cannot happen, right? Who is going to explain to you what Allah is? How are you going to understand Allah? Without Ali ibn Abi Talib, without al Hassan al mushtaba without Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, right? How are you going to understand Allah if you don't have these crucial gateways towards Allah? And that's where in that narration where we see that there's an amalgamation, yeah, between the Tawheed of the intellect and the Tawheed of the heart, right? Knowing Allah and knowing the Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam, knowing the Imam of your time, right? They come together, right? When you come together, then you are worshipping Allah, right? Without those two things, you are worshipping other than Allah, according to the Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam. Then, we want to take a look at the verses of the Qur'an with regards to this specific topic, right? What does Allah say in Surah Al-Imran, right? Verse number 31, Allah says, after the Basmala, He says, قُلْ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهَ فَاتَّبِعُونِ يُحْبِبْكُمُ اللَّهَ وَيَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ ذُنُوبَكُمْ وَاللَّهُ غَفُورٌ رَحِيمٌ Right? He says, in kuntum tuhibbun Allah, right? If you truly love Allah, fattabi'uni, then follow me, right? This is an example in the Quran, right? The only way that you can love Allah, follow Allah, know Allah, is through following Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What do we find in the narrations of Ahlul Bayt alayhi wa What does Ahlul Bayt say? They say, awwaluna Muhammad, awsatuna Muhammad, wa akhiruna Muhammad, wa kulluna Muhammad. Right? That the first of us is Muhammad, the middle of us is Muhammad, the last of us is Muhammad, and all of us are Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In this ayah of the Qur'an, when he says, فَاتَّبِعُونِي This is speaking about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but every single member of the Imams of Ahlul Bayt alayhi wa sallam as well. Right? إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهِ فَاتَّبِعُونِي If you love Allah, then follow Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If you love Allah, then follow Ali ibn Abi Talib. If you love Allah, then follow Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salatu wa If you love Allah, then you should follow the Imams of Ahlul Bayt alayhi wa sallam. That is what is going to show your love for Allah and give you understanding of Allah. Right? Then we have in another ayah of the Qur'an. Right? In Surah Al-Nisa. Yeah? We have ayah number 80. What does Allah say? Allah says, "Man yuta'a rasula faqad ata'a Allah." Right? The one who obeys the messenger, then he's obeyed Allah. Right? This is the intrinsic connection between the rasul and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? And the imam of our time, right? It is only through their obedience, through them that we can understand 
the gateway to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is them and none other than them, right? So in order to help explain this concept a bit better, right? Because some of the some of the verses that I've used, maybe they may not completely give you the complete vision, right? So let's take an example of a story in the Quran, right? To help us understand this concept a bit better, right? And we're going to take the example of none other than shaitan, right? Because everybody's familiar with this story. So I think it would be easier for us to kind of, you know, relate to if we speak about it. Uh, with regards to the ayat in the Quran, right? So everybody knows the story, right? Shaitan was there. Allah ordered everybody to prostrate, all the angels to prostrate to Adam. Shaitan re refused to um, prostrate to Adam, and for that reason, he was cursed, right? So he says, Allah says in Surah Al Baqarah, right? Verse number 34, Allah says, بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وإذ قلنا للملائكة اسجدوا لآدم فسجدوا إلا إبليس أبا واستكبر وكان من الكافرين right he says and when we said to the angels to prostrate towards Adam so all of them prostrated except for Iblis he rejected this order and he was arrogant right Allah always in when he speaks about Iblis right he always focuses on this word the idea that he was arrogant right وَكَانَ مِنَ الْكَافِرِينَ And he was from the disbelievers, right? So this is something that's interesting. When we think about disbelief, right? Why is shaitan a disbeliever, right? Did shaitan disbelieve in the existence of Allah? Of course he didn't. Shaitan worshipped Allah. For some narrations say he worshipped him for 6,000 years, right? He knows Allah exists, right? He's speaking to Allah. He is well-knowing of the Mala al A'la, he knows about the higher stations of existence, he knows about everything, he knows Allah, right? So, why is Allah saying here that Wakana min al Kafirin? Right? We see the answer in his arrogance, right? What is his arrogance and why was he arrogant? Why is he described as being arrogant? We see this in the verses that come before this ayah, right? Allah says, وَعَلَّمَ عَادَمَ الْأَسْمَاءَ كُلَّهَا ثُمَّ عَرَضَهُمْ عَلَى الْمَلَائِكَةِ فَقَالَ أَنْبِئُونِي بِأَسْمَاءِ هَؤُلَاءِ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ Right? Allah says that Allah taught Adam all of the names, right? He didn't say which names, He says the names, الأسماء كلها ثم عرضهم على الملائكة Then He showed them to the angels and He said to the angels, tell me of the names of these Right? Ha'ulai, these people, if you are to be truthful. And the angel said, Qalu subhanaka la ilma lana illa ma alamtana. Right? They say that praise be to you or glory be to you. Right? We have no knowledge except that which you have given us. Right? Inna ka antal alimul hakim. Indeed, you are the one that is all knowing and all wise. Right? Allah says to Adam, Qala ya Adamu anbi'hum bi asma'ihim. Right? He says to Adam, you tell them of what their names are. Right? So Allah has given Adam here specific knowledge with regards to specific names here, right? And Adam has been given this for a specific reason, right? Because from his loins, it's going to be Adam's loins from which the Ahl Bayt come, right? It was the nur of Ahl Bayt right? In the loins of Adam that made him worthy of prostration, right? From all of the angels. And that is why shaitan was described as arrogant. Shaitan did not want to prostrate to a nur that he knew was greater than him, right? A nur that he was jealous of. It was the nur of Ahl Bayt in the loins of Adam السلام, that made him worthy of that prostration. And that was the reason that shaitan did not prostrate to Adam, right? So what happens to shaitan now? Shaitan is told that you are from the kafirin, you are from the disbelievers, right? Why is he a disbeliever? Like we said, he believes in the existence of Allah. The reason why he's a disbeliever is because he rejected the gate of Allah, right? Allah has ordered him to prostrate to Adam. He said, this is how I want you to worship me, by prostrating to Adam here, right? If Allah ordered shaitan to prostrate to him, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, shaitan had been doing that for the last 6,000 years. Shaitan had no problem with that, with going directly to Allah, as some people say, you know? Some people say that. Why can't we go directly to Allah, right? What's the problem in going directly to Allah, if Allah is there and Allah is there to be called? 
But Allah is actually showing you here that Allah has a designated gate. He chooses how you worship him. You don't choose how you worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? And it was because of shaitan's rejection of the gate of Allah, not of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because of his rejection of the gate way to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that Allah cursed him and he sent him away, right? And this is why he was a kafir, right? We see in the narrations of Ahl-Bayt what do they say? They say, Man abad Allah bittawahum faqad kafar, right? The one that worships Allah based on his own whims and his imagination, then he's disbelieved, right? The one who doesn't choose the gate of Allah that Allah has designated himself to go through towards Allah, then he's disbelieved. That's why shaitan is called a kafir in the Quran. Because he's tried to worship Allah without using the gate that Allah designated for him, right? And that's a very interesting point. Shaitan doesn't disbelieve in Allah. Shaitan knows that Allah is there. Right? He knows that Allah exists. Right? His rejection was of the gate of Allah. His rejection was of Adam. His rejection was of the nur that was in the loins of Adam, the nur of Ahl Bayt Right? His jealousy, his arrogance. And that was the reason why shaitan became shaitan. Look at the ayat of the Quran again. Right? What does Allah say with regards to the uh, story of Iblis? And we see in Surah al Sad. We have in verse number 71, Allah says, right? إِذْ قَالَ رَبُّكَ لِلْمَلَائِكَةِ إِنِّي خَالِقٌ بَشْرًا مِنْ طِينٌ Right? Allah says to the angels that I am to make a human being from dirt, yeah? From earth, from clay. فَإِذَا سَوَيْتُهُ وَنَفَقْتُ فِيهِ مِنْ رُوحِي فَقَأُوا لَهُ سَاجِدِينَ So if I was to fashion him and I was to breathe my soul into him, then fall in prostration towards him. فَسَجَدَ الْمَلَائِكَةُ كُلُّهُمْ أَجْمَعُونَ So all of the angels fell in prostration towards him. إِلَّا إِبْلِيسَ اسْتَكْبَرَ وَكَانَ مِنَ الْكَافِرِينَ Except for Iblis, he was arrogant and he was from the disbelievers. Again, arrogance. Yeah? So Allah asks him here. قَالَ يَا إِبْلِيسُ مَا مَنَعَكَ أَن تَسْجُدَ لِمَا خَلَقْتُ بِيَدَيَّ أَسْتَكْبَرْتَ أَمْ كُنْتَ مِنَ الْعَالِينَ Right? This is an interesting question that Allah asks him here. He says, O oh Iblis, what was it that prevented you from prostrating to that which I created with my hands? Right? Astakbarta am kunta min al Were you proud? Right? Were you arrogant? Were you just arrogant? Or are you from the elevated ones? Are you from the alin? Right? Some of the translations that you'll find of this ayah online incorrectly translate al alin to be arrogant ones, right? If it was to mean arrogant, then Allah would ask him twice, right? Saying, are you arrogant or are you arrogant? Like, that doesn't make sense, right? There has to be a dichotomy here. If Allah says, were you arrogant? Or were you from the alin? Were you from the elevated ones? Those who do not prostrate to anybody, right? Who are these elevated ones? Who are these people that don't prostrate to anybody, right? We see in the narrations of Ahl Bayt salam that this is explained, right? And this is what we mentioned as well from the explanation with regards to the loins of Adam containing the nur of Ahl Bayt salam, which is what made him worthy of prostration, right? We have this narration, I'm reading for you from Bihar al-Anwar, volume number 25. It's actually narrated originally from the book Fadail al-Shia by Shaykh al-Saduq, right? And it is from Abi Sa'id al-Khudri. Right, the companion of Rasulullah He says we were sitting with Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam And a person asked him Ya Rasulullah Akhbirni an qawlillahi azza wa jal li iblis Right, this person asked Rasulullah He said, can you tell me more about this ayah in the Quran Where Allah says to iblis Astakbarta am kunta min al-alin Right, were you arrogant Or were you from the, ele were you from the elevated ones Right so this person asks Rasulullah, he says, فَمَنْ هُمْ يَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ أَلَّذِينَ هُمْ أَعْلَى مِنَ الْمَلَائِكَةِ Right? So this person, he understood it, right? Alin means elevated ones, linguistically even, right? The ones that are high, right? So he's asking, he's saying, who are these people who are even higher in their closeness and their proximity to Allah than the angels themselves, right? So Rasulullah, what does he respond? He says, فَقَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ أَنَا وَعَلِيٌّ وَفَاطِمَ وَحَسَنٌ وَالْحُسَيْنٌ so Rasulullah says that we were upon the pavilions of the arsh, of the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we used to do tasbih of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before 
all of the angels before every creation, right? And then Allah created Adam and he, he ordered all of the malaika to do sujood towards Adam, right? فَسَجَدَتْ سَلْمَلَائِكَةُ كُلُّهُمْ إِلَّا إِبْلِيسِ فَإِنَّهُ أَبَى أَنْ يَسْجُدْ Right? Except for Iblis who refused to do sujood, right? So when Allah created Adam, He cre He asked all of the angels to prostrate, right? And then Rasulullah says, وَلَمْ يَعْمُرُنَا بِالسُّجُودِ And He didn't ask us to do sujood. Why? Because they are the elevated ones. They were there actually doing tasbih of Allah prior to all of creation, right? We spoke about this in uh, previous episodes, right? The Imams of Creation, Muhammad, Ali, and Fatima, right? They were with Allah for a thousand lifetimes, infinite amount of lifetime of lifetimes prior to everything else being created, right? So they were not ordered to prostrate to Adam because they are greater than him and closest in proximity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? So Rasulullah explains, he says, so all of the angels when they prostrated and Iblis didn't prostrate, Allah said to him, Astakbarta am kunta min al -aaleen. Were you arrogant or were you from the Aaleen? Are you from the elevated ones? He's almost saying that to him in a sarcastic way, right? Because Shaitan is jealous of them, right? Shaitan doesn't want to prostrate because he is jealous of the maqam and the stature of the Ahl Bayt, salam, right? So he is coming away from that and Allah is asking him, do you, you, do you not prostrate because you are arrogant or is it because you want to be from the Aaleen? Are you from the Aaleen such that you don't need to prostrate? Right? So then Rasulullah says that the Aaleen are those who, whose five names were written upon the pavilions of the Arsh. Right? And then Rasulullah says, We are the gate of Allah. We were the door of Allah through which you enter to, to, to see Allah, to understand Allah, to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? They are the door of Allah. نَحْنُ بَابُ اللَّهِ الَّذِي يُؤْتَى مِنْ Right? This is the explanation of Tawheed, yeah? He says, بِنَا يَحْتَدِ muhtadun. Through us, those who seek guidance are guided, right? فَمَنْ أَحَبَّنَا أَحَبَّهُ اللَّهِ Right? وَأَسْكَنَهُ جَنَّةَ Right? So the one who is to love us, Allah loves him. And Allah will put him in his Jannah. وَمَنْ أَبْغَذَنَا أَبْغَذَهُ اللَّهُ وَأَسْكَنَهُ نَارًا Right? That the one who hates us, Allah hates him, and he will put him in the hellfire. So Rasulullah says here clearly, right? We were the door to Allah, right? We were the gate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is where shaitan went wrong in his rejection of the gate of Allah. This is why he became Iblis, right? This is why he became the one upon whose Allah's la'na is, right? As a result of his rejection of this, this is where now you see Allah say to him, what does he say? As a result of his rejection of the gate of Allah, Allah says to him, قَالَ فَخْرُجْ مِنْهَا فَإِنَّكَ رَجِيمٌ Right? He says, exit from here then, because you are now accursed. وَإِنَّ عَلَيْكَ لَعْنَةِ إِلَى يَوْمِ الدِّينَ And upon you now is my curse and damnation until the day of judgment. Because he rejected the gate of Allah. Right? He wanted Tawheed without Ali bin Abi Talib. He wanted Tawheed without Fatima to Zahra. He wanted Tawheed without Ahl Bayt alayhi salam. And that was his end. Right? That was where the damnation of Allah remained. And it will remain till the day of judgment upon Shaitan. Right? So when we're talking about Tawheed, we need to understand what we're talking about. We need to understand the conception of Tawheed in the teachings of the Ahl Bayt alayhi salam. Let's not think about this from a Salafi understanding, right, of Tawheed. Right? Just, okay, you don't need any mediums to Allah. Allah doesn't have a gate. Allah, you can, you, you can think of Allah as you want. He becomes a fragment of your imagination. One with hands, one with curly hair. You know, maybe he's wearing some nice clothes. Maybe you see him in a dream and he doesn't actually look that nice. And that's just a reflection of your bad iman, according to other schools of Islam. Right? This is all imagination. Right? Look at the Quran. Look at this example of shaitan rejecting the gate of Allah and look what happens to him. Right? The gate of Allah is important. And that's why Rasulullah, what does he say? Yeah, he said here in that narration that we are the door to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we see this, see this across our narrations. This is the understanding of Tawheed. So when you reject the gate to Allah, you become a disbeliever. You're finished. You're done. Like, there's no more Islam for you. Yeah, there's no understanding of Allah. There's no Tawheed when you reject the gate of Allah. Right? And like I promised, we're going to go through some supplications of ours right and visitational supplications which you know speak about this concept a little bit more 
we read in Ziyar Jami'at al kabira right? This is a Ziyarah that was taught by our 10th Imam, alayhi salatu wasalam, right? Imam al-Hadi, right? A companion goes to Imam al-Hadi and he says, teach me the most eloquent Ziyarah by which I can visit any of my Imams, right? Teach me the best of that which I have capacity to be able to say to my Imam, right? And this is what the Imam teaches him. And this ziyara, by by the way, is accepted as authentic by all the mainstream scholars, right? Including, there's a statement also of uh, Sayyid Ali Sistani. He says very clearly that this ziyara is beyond doubt. Everything within it is clear and it is true and authentic, very clearly. We read in the ziyara that we say, Man arad Allah bada bikum, right? The one who wants Allah, he starts with you. Right, woman, wahadahu qabila ankum, and the one who professes his oneness is one who accepts you. Woman, qasadahu tawajjaha bikum. Right, and the one who intends to go towards Allah, he turns using you. Right, with you. Right, and this is what it says in Mafatih al Janan. But in fact, the more correct statement, and we find this in the more classical sources of Ziyad Jami'ah, like Oyun Akbar Rida by. Uh, Saduq, that we say This is what the ziyara is saying You want Allah, turn towards Muhammad You want Allah, turn towards Ali You want Allah, turn towards Fatima Right? This is what the ziyara is saying Yeah? That Right? The one who wishes Allah, that intends Allah He turns towards you He turns towards you, Ahlul Bayt Right? Right? And the reason for this is because they are the face of Allah. They are the door of Allah, right? We read this in uh, Dua Nudba, right? Which many of you will be very familiar with, right? What do we say to the Imam of our time in our yearning, in our calling out to him? What do we say? We say, Where is the door of Allah from which we can enter, from which it is entered, right? Towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Aina wajhullahi alladhi ilayhi yatawajjahu al-awliya. Where is the face of Allah that the saints actually turn towards in order to go towards Allah, right? You can see the meanings are the same, right? And the meanings have been the same throughout everything that we've mentioned here. Throughout the hadith in Al-Kafi, throughout the Quran, throughout these yarat and these du'as and these supplications that we're reading from. This is the... The beauty of the literature of Ahl Bayt salam. The more that you read it, the more that you see that everything is symmetrical Everything fits together like a puzzle, right? And you can see the same meaning being pushed every single thing that we read, right? That is towards them, they are the door of Allah, they are the face of Allah And this is the only way that Tawheed can truly exist And it is because of this reason, right? All of these things that we've read, right? Showing that the Imam is the direction towards Allah. The Imam is the one who points towards Allah. This is why we see the narrations, yeah? Where the Imams say, we have this narration in uh, Al-Kafi. Maybe I've marked it. Let me have a look. Yeah, we have this narration from Imam Sadiq alayhi salam. It's quite a famous narration that uh, Amar, Muawiyah ibn Ammar, he asked Imam Sadiq alayhi salam, uh, about the ayah of the Quran, right? Walillahi al asma al husna fadu biha, right? Where Allah says in Surah Al Araf that Allah to Allah belong the most beautiful names, so call him by them, right? What does the Imam say? He says, Nahnu wallahi al asma al husna, alati la yaqbalu Allahu min min al ibad amalan illa bi ma'rifatina, right? He says, I swear by Allah that we are those names of Allah, those beautiful names. Those names that which, if no one, if people were not to have our ma'rifa, Allah does not even accept a single action from them, right? Why does the Imam say this? When he says that we are the names of Allah, right? That sounds a bit like, you know, it sounds a bit extreme. But this is a technical point, right? With regards to names, like for example, my name is Muhammad Ali, right? In your mind, when you hear Muhammad Ali, you think of my face, right? But my name is not me. It is a name, so it points towards me, right? When you hear Muhammad Ali, you think of me, but my name is not actually me in itself. My existence is actually outside of my name. This was something that was given to me so that people could identify me to be able to know who I am, right? So when I say Muhammad Ali, you think of me in your mind, right? Or maybe you think of the boxer. You probably think of the boxer. I'm not that famous. But when you think of Muhammad Ali, yeah, you think of me in your mind, right? So the same way, when you think of the Imams, when you bring the imams into this picture 
with regards to them being the names of Allah, they are the ones that point towards the direction of Allah, right? They are the reflection of Allah's names. They are the manifestation of Allah's names on earth, right? When you want to see the most merciful person, you go towards Rasulullah, right? Why does Allah call him, you see? Allah says in the Quran about Rasulullah, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ Right? Rasulullah is a manifestation of the rahmah of Allah, right? We have this across the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You find them all in the Ahl al-Bayt alayhi salam, right? The beauty of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you see them all in the Ahl al-Bayt alayhi salam. And they are the names of Allah which point towards His existence, which point towards Him. And they are the ones through whom we can understand Tawheed, right? And this is why we read, and they are not only the names of Allah, rather they are the greatest name of Allah, right? What do we read in this dua? In the one of the duas of Laylatul Mab'ath, we read with regards to one of the names of Allah, right? And this is a proof that the names of Allah are also created, right? What do we see? He says, وَبِسْمِكَ الْعَظَمِ 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 Right? By your greatest, greatest, greatest name. Al-Ajal al-Akram. Right? In some manuscripts, I believe it says Al-Ajal al-Azil akram Right? The most generous. Right? The most mighty. Right? And the most honorable. Right? Al-Ladhi khalaqtahu. That which you created. That name which you created. Fastaqarra fi dhillik. Yeah? Fala yukhraju minka ila ghayrak. Right? That which you created so it remained in your shadow, right? And it doesn't leave you to go anywhere else, right? This is the Ismullah al azam This is the Ahl al-Bayt This is the Nur of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Haqiqa al muhammadiya right? That Allah created and it remained in his shadow. It remained with him. And we can see indications of this in the Quran, but we don't have time right now. So this is an explanation of the Tawheed of Allah. This is the... Grand Tawheed of Allah and the names of the Ahlul Bayt salam, that are the most close to Allah in proximity and the only gateway towards Him. They are your way to Allah and it is them that are the face of Allah and it is them that are the door to Allah and it is them that will teach us Tawheed and it is them and it is them and it is them. Everything in this religion it goes back to the Imam Al Ma'asum. As we mentioned in our previous episodes, the asl of the religion is the Imam of our time. So let me end with this beautiful line from Ziyad Jami'a that we read earlier on where we said Man arad Allah bada'a bikum sadati ahl al-bayt sarawasullahi wa salamu alaykum ajma'een Right? So thank you very much for listening to this episode. I hope to see you all again next season where we'll be continuing our Jum'a Nights episodes and we'll be coming back with a bang inshallah. I'll see you then. Wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.